Well, the brief epistle of 2 John could have been written on a single piece of papyrus. The fact that it has been preserved down through the years is a testimony to the doctrine of inspiration. We know that all scripture is God-breathed and God not only has given it originally, but he has preserved that which he wants to be considered a part of the canon of scripture. As you look at the epistle of 2 John, you will notice uh, some similarity, similarity to all three of the epistles, and that is that in none of them does John use his own name to identify himself as the author. Now, this is in keeping with John's reticent personality, which we shall see shortly. Uh, he doesn't even refer to himself uh, uh, in, except for a few occasions, you'll notice, in the, in the Gospel of John, but rather uses uh, terms like the apostle whom Jesus loved, etc. And this letter, as does 3 John, begins abruptly with the simple description of himself as the elder. The Greek word for elder is presbuteros. Looks like this in the Greek. P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-R-O-S. -E presbuteros. Which is literally the old man. Now, you have to understand that the meaning of a particular word in Scripture is determined by its usage. Paul uses it in an entirely different way than John does. Paul uses it to refer to the pastor teacher as the top man in the local congregation. Uh, and uh, uh, that is a very definite legitimate usage. However, the Apostle John does not take that usage from the word. It's undoubtedly used here of an affectionate designation by which the Apostle John was known to his readers. There is some ancient evidence that at this time it was also used to designate any apostle or eyewitness to the life and teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, either way, it's perfectly legitimate to be used as uh, it is here. He calls himself the elder, the old man, the remaining a disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we'll look uh, more at him in a few moments when we study 2 John chapter 1, verse 1. But first let me give you an outline of the book of 2 John, and you'll see why I have selected this as uh, the book to teach at this point on the Thursday Bible class. It's, as I said, just one chapter long and 13 verses, so it's not going to be a long, long study protracted into ad infinitum, as some of my studies are. But uh, it begins in verses 1 and 2 with a simple but very beautiful introduction. And uh, it's going to take a little work for us to get through those verses because we've got to identify uh, both the elder learn something about him, and also about the woman to whom he is writing. Then the main body of the uh, epistle is found in verses 4 through 11. And I call this section the importance of Bible doctrine. And it's divided into two portions. In verses 4 to 6, we have doctrine practice. Verses 7 to 11, doctrine protected. Then point three, the, his intention now is uh, given in verse 12 in which the Apostle John says, I intend to elaborate face to face on some of the doctrine which I have taught you. And verse 13 is the beautiful final salutation which is uh, given to us by the Apostle John. All right, uh, 2 John 1.1 1, 1 begins uh, in the New International. The elder to the chosen lady and her children 
whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth. Of course, all ancient letters began with the identification of the writer first, and then the recipient of that letter. In this case, he neither names himself nor the specific person to whom he is writing. But his emphasis in this one chapter long letter is on two words, the word love and the word truth, which as you should know if you've been listening to my teaching for any length of time, that truth comes from a Greek word which can be translated faith, faithfulness, uh, uh, doctrine. It's what is believed and what is Bible doctrine. This is absolute truth which is aletheia in the Greek, and absolute truth is Bible doctrine. Well, since I have already commented on the first two words in the book, it's time now for us to pause for the very first doctrine which we're going to study. It's called the Doctrine of the Apostle John. And so let's go through it uh, point by point. It may be called an isagogic, or it may be called a doctrine. Either way, take your choice. But uh, I want to introduce you to a man who has become a very dear friend of mine, having uh, taught the Gospel of John many, many years ago, having taught 1 John several years ago, and now teaching of 2 John. John was a native of the northern Palestinian Roman province called Galilee. The historian Josephus describes the people who inhabited the province of Galilee as lively, laborious, quite independent, and warlike. Point two, the Galilean Jews were different than those in the province of Judea. If you will uh, look at the map in the back of your Bible, most Bibles have a set of maps. Uh, somehow or other, when I moved here, I did not, I thought I was leaving my maps and charts for the, my successor, but they were never used and they were not found when the church was uh, disbanded and assimilated by another congregation. So I don't have these any longer, although they were uh, prized possessions of mine, but I relinquished them in favor of helping the congregation if the uh, pastor needed these illustrations, which apparently he did not, and therefore they did not. At any rate, in the back of your Bible you will notice if you have uh, perhaps the uh, statement Palestine in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll find three actually actual divisions. The northern province was called Galilee, the southern province was called Judea, and between the two was the province of Samaria. And uh, that made up the three parts on the west side of Jordan, and on the east side you have the province of Perea, E-E-R, E A. But the Galilean Jews who lived in the province of Galilee were quite different from the Jews who chose to live in the southern province of Judea, and certainly quite different from the half Jews which uh, inhabited the area of uh, uh, the portion between the two, uh, known as Samaria. But uh, while today the uh, uh, religious authority, uh, pardon me, the, the religious authorities in Jerusalem had a lot of authority uh, over the southern Jews and they uh, in, intimidated them greatly. But uh, the religious authorities in Jerusalem <laughs> had very little effect on the Galileans. Uh, as a matter of fact, Godet uh, describes them as, quote, more free from prejudice, more open to the immediate impression of the truth. Galilean hearts offered to Jesus that receptive soil which his work demanded. And for your information, all of the twelve, uh, except Judas Iscariot, came from the province of Galilee. 
And for the most part, our Lord's major ministry was located among the, the Galileans. Uh, it was only on rare occasions when he did go to the south and minister in Judea. Point three, the Lord Jesus, uh, pardon me, John lived along the western shores of the Sea of Galilee. And while today this area is sparsely settled, in that day it was covered with towns and cities having many thousands of inhabitants. Uh, some of these uh, cities, uh, Bethsaida, Chorazin, Capernaum, were all uh, inhabited by men who were uh, fishermen. And we read uh, in uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 10, And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. Uh, they uh, are said here to be partners to the brothers uh, known as uh, Simon and Andrew. And uh, we look in John 1.44 and we find that Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And so we know then that Peter was from Bethsaida and uh, therefore we can be pretty well sure that his partners uh, were either from Bethsaida or a town which wasn't far from Bethsaida and that would be Capernaum. Um, because uh, of the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, upon leaving the synagogue of Capernaum in Mark 129, it says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. So from the Capernaum uh, synagogue, it couldn't have been too far to the home of uh, Peter and Andrew uh, in Bethsaida. So it's good possibility they were... Uh, they lived in either of those two towns, seaport towns on the Sea of Galilee, because, as you noted, uh, they were partners with Simon in a fishing business, Simon Peter. Point four, let's look at the family of John, which from scriptural revelation uh, it tells us only a few things. Uh, it consists uh, of his brother James, and since James is usually mentioned first, in the accounts, we can assume that James was the older uh, of the two brothers. His father Zebedee, who was also a fisherman, we discover from Mark 1, verses 19 and 20, which when we're, where we read, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. Apparently the business was uh, prosperous and big enough for Zebedee to be able to have uh, hired men in addition to his sons working the boat. In addition to uh, Zebedee the father, James and John, the two brothers, uh, we also note his mother's name was Salome or Salome, Hebrew for Shalom or peace. Matthew 25, 56 tells us among the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Uh, they were all present, according to Matthew 27, 56, at the crucifixion. And Mark 15, 40 tells us uh, also uh, of the women at the crucifixion and names uh, them And we have the, the same names again, but the mother of Zebedee's sons is named in Mark 1540. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and Joseph, and Salome. So uh, we now have a picture of the whole family. Uh, apparently, from what we know, uh, Salome was a very zealous follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do not know anything about Zebedee, except the fact that he did have some wealth because he did have day laborers working uh, for them, and uh, as we saw in Mark 1.20. But um, 
In Luke 8, 3, we read that uh, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others, these women were helping to support the disciples out of their own means. So apparently uh, the family did have some uh, measure of wealth uh, at that time. We also read in John 19, 27, that when our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross uh, gave uh, the care of his mother, uh, Mary, to John, we read uh, uh, in John 19, 27, to the disciple, referring to John, here is your, your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his own home. So uh, apparently he did have this, uh, uh, responsibility and had a place to take her his very own home <clears throat> now moving on th then to point five the training in John's home there are uh, two things which uh, apparently tell us that uh, James and John were trained by their mother in the things of the Lord and in the scriptures. Um, we've already noted her selfless service from the fact that she ministered to the Lord from her means, but we uh, uh, also must understand that she wouldn't have done so unless she definitely believed that the Lord Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah and she reveals this in her brazen request on behalf of her sons, which is recorded in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, where we read, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. Well, you can see that she believed in his messianic kingdom and therefore she accepted him as the promised Messiah who would be setting up his kingdom. Though she did not understand, along with everyone else, exactly what uh, the, the Lord was doing, nevertheless she did uh, recognize him as the promised Messiah. Uh, her request also reveals her enthusiasm and her uh, conviction. And uh, I wouldn't have any doubt that uh, she passed this enthusiasm and conviction on to her sons uh, because that's very often the case in a mother who really loves uh, doctrine and loves the Lord uh, has a fantastic influence on her children and can pass that information on and that enthusiasm on to her children. Uh, we also noted, we can note from John 1, verses 36 and 37, uh, John's enthusiasm and his conviction. Uh, he is uh, listed uh, as the, the second disciple together with Andrew, who were both disciples of John the baptizer. And um, uh, when our... Uh, uh, when, in the passage 136 and 37 of John, when uh, he saw Jesus passing by, this is John the baptizer, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples, that would be Andrew and John, heard him say this, they followed Jesus. So you can see that it didn't take them more than just the, uh, the cognition that J the Lord Jesus Christ was uh, the Lamb of God, and uh, they were ready to follow. Now let's look under point six at the chronology of John's call. A, there's no question that John was one of the baptizer's disciples, according to the passage I quoted in just a moment ago in John 1, 36 and 37. B, our Lord Jesus Christ returns from his baptism at the River Jordan to Nazareth. Then, three days later, he goes from Nazareth, his home, to Cana in Galilee for the wedding 
which is recorded in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 and following. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. It, it was at Cana of Galilee where he performed this first miracle uh, of his ministry, which also identifies him very clearly to his disciples as being the one whom he ha is claims to be. The, the miracle was uh, not necessarily to provide more wine, but as a, a credential of the fact that he was who he said he was. Now, uh, point C, after this, his mother and his half-brothers take a trip to Capernaum, John 2.12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Subsequently, according to Matthew 4.13, he actually moves into Capernaum. It says, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Nephtali. Uh, point D, we, we have to assume that apparently the Lord sent them back to their families as he returned to his uh, living now in Capernaum. I'm going to guess that uh, Joseph uh, is not alive any longer. Uh, my previous study had revealed to me, uh, I think, that uh, Mary married quite an older man and uh, he did not live. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, it was uh, the reason our Lord Jesus Christ didn't start his public ministry till age 30, because being the oldest son in the family was his responsibility to take care of the family until uh, there, the rest of the children were on their own and uh, it was no longer uh, the responsibility of anyone else to take care of them. Anyway, point E, when the time for our Lord's public ministry arrived, he calls James and John, Peter and Andrew, and the other disciples to follow him in a permanent way. We find this in uh, Matthew 4, verses 18 to 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The difference between the previous discipleship and this discipleship is discipleship really means nothing more than a student. And uh, they were students, first of all, of John the Baptizer. Then they were students of our Lord Jesus Christ. and. Uh, uh, it was just, uh, an, a, 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 he was the teacher. Now, however, really what they're doing is becoming a part of his traveling seminary. Uh, they are going to be, do nothing else uh, but to study under uh, their teacher. And uh, this, both of these types were common uh, in that day. You have, uh, even going back to Socrates, he had his disciples and Plato and all the others of uh, the Greek teachers. They had their their uh, disciples, uh, and there were the two kinds. So now, these uh, among uh, the others have now become a part of the Lord's traveling seminary, and uh, he is going to teach them full time. Point F, apparently among the inner circle of disciples, uh, we find four names mentioned. Peter, and Andrew, James, and John. And according to Luke 6.13, he designates them as apostles. For it says, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, 
whom he also designated apostles. An apostle here is not used in the technical sense, again, that the apostle Paul uses it. He uses, it is used here in the sense of a sent one, one who is sent under the authority of the teacher. To further indicate that uh, John was among the inner circle, we read that it was Peter, James, and John who alone are admitted to the raising of Jairus' daughter in Luke 8.51. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Uh, then they were with him at his transfiguration. Matthew 17, 1 and 2 we read, After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And, uh, and of course, they were those uh, uh, who went to the inner part of the Garden of Gethsemane with him when he was praying. Matthew 26, verses 36 and 37 says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And finally, in Luke 22, verse 8, uh, which actually takes place before the Matthew incident, uh, we read that Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Our Lord was privileged to be one of the two on this very secret mission of preparing the Passover. Now, uh, what would make uh, a difference in... Uh, our Lord selecting these men, these three uh, men, to be a part of an inner circle. Uh, when he had selected twelve, of course, uh, to be uh, the apostles or the sent ones, and from, um, from all of the students that he had disciples, he singled out twelve, and from the twelve, these three. Uh, I know that our Lord would never play favorites because he was too um, filled with integrity. My conclusion is that these three men, above all of the others, evidenced fantastic positive volition to the teaching ministry of our Lord and Savior. I, uh, I recognize uh, that this is a distinct possibility. Down through the years, uh, there have been many people who have been positive toward doctrine. Some uh, have uh, been positive when it is convenient. Some were positive uh, for a period of time and then they fell by the wayside. Some were uh, uh, po uh, on again, off again, on, uh, in again, out again. Uh, you just never knew, uh, you could never depend on them, you could never count on them. But there have been, down through the years, a few, and I'm, I'm placing an emphasis on the few because I believe that's the way it was with our Lord. Very, very few are very positive toward doctrine. They want the Word of God. They want it as it is taught, word by word, verse by verse, in categories. And they hunger for it. It reminds me, blessed are they, or happy are they, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. They shall be filled. When, when it is the number one priority of life, it is these people who progress towards spiritual maturity. Now, this does not uh, discount the fact that they still had all sin natures, and they still failed. And we're going to see we do know how Peter failed, it was very obvious, but I'm also going to point out to you John's uh, shortcoming, or the problem that John faced. Uh, whenever John uh, slipped out of fellowship, uh, he slipped into a condition, a condition that was well known to our Lord and Savior, which we shall see 
eventually. Not many people remember uh, that uh, he did have an old sin nature. But uh, the point is that these men were positive. And listen, because they were positive, they got more than the other disciples. They picked up more. They assimilated more. They applied more. And that illustrates the, the, the passage that, uh, in fact, the statement of our Lord and Savior Himself. Uh, I believe it's Mark uh, 4, uh, 2, 3, or 4. Uh, but the point being that He says, To him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that he hath. That sounds rather startling. But it is, an, it is a principle. It is true that the person who has uh, a doctrine, who is positive, who wants it, God will just give more and more and more. But to the one who just gets a little smattering here and there, uh, he loses what he already has. You see, there's a principle uh, of doctrine that is involved here. And this is what it is that there is a, 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 a point in everyone's life we're always forgetting what we have learned. We are going to forget what we have learned. But there is a point in which the learning exceeds the forgetting. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. There comes a point when you're taking in and taking in and taking in. You're never going to remember everything that you learn. Uh, I know Doc uh, uh, Hughes had a fantastic, almost photographic memory. And he always amazed me how he uh, could remember the specific uh, scenes in motion pictures that he had seen. But uh, the point that I'm making here, that even with a photographic memory, you're going to forget. But there comes a point in your spiritual advance, as you reach towards spiritual maturity, where your remembering of doctrine exceeds your forgetting of doctrine, and uh, this is when you are really, uh, God is adding and adding and adding things that are so fantastic that you never thought uh, possible. And uh, you think doctrine, you, you uh, joke around doctrine, everything clicks in uh, to a doctrine that you have in your mind. Whatever you read, whatever you see, whatever you hear, which enables you to consistently think in terms of divine viewpoint. So, uh, we, we can understand something then about the inner circle. And uh, uh, if, uh, let me ask you this. If our Lord Jesus Christ were to select his inner circle today from among those who are positive to our doctrine, you for example, would you be among the inner circle or would you be among the, the secondary or the outer circle? Only you can answer that. But uh, I can tell you this, the impact of the inner circle as far as being invisible heroes and impacting the society in which God places them far greater than the outer circle. All right, sub point, or now point seven in the doctrine of the Apostle John. John receives the designation from himself. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. He uses this designation in John 13, 23, John 19, 26, John 20, verse 2, John 21, verses 7 and 20 and following. Now, this is a part of his character which we shall look at in our next point. But uh, it appears that he was the one who sat directly next to the Lord Jesus Christ at the Last Supper, indicating that John enjoyed a very special relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, John 13.23 tells us one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, 
was reclining next to him. Uh, and remember this, that um, uh, when they were questioning uh, who it was who the Lord Jesus at the Last Supper had indicated that one would betray, uh, Peter turns to John because John is sitting next to our Lord and he says uh, uh, to him, uh, ask him who it was. Uh, you're sitting closer, uh, ask him who it was. Uh, I don't believe John did. John's not the same Peter. Peter, who, who is it? And, uh, not, John's retiring character would not permit him to do that. Uh, furthermore, I think that uh, John uh, had this special designation of a fe special relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ because, remember, it was he to whom our Lord Jesus Christ entrusted the keeping of his mother. John 19, 26, and 27. Uh, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that would be John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his own home. Furthermore, did you notice that Jesus Christ is on the cross? And notice who he sees. Uh, <laughs> The Lord Jesus Christ seems, sees John standing nearby. The uh, scripture tells us that they all forsook him and fled, not the Apostle John. This timid soul was faithful, even standing below the cross, while everyone else forsook him and fled. Perhaps that's something uh, tells us something about him that endeared him to the heart of our Lord and Savior and endeared the Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. At any rate, I'm convinced too that, uh, and we'll see it later in my, uh, uh, in, in the doctrine of the Apostle John, that uh, I'm convinced that John did not begin his public ministry as an apostle until after Mary had died and he was no longer therefore responsible to take care of her. But doesn't it surprise you that our Lord entrusted Mary, his mother, to John rather than to his brothers or his sisters? Well, it tells us that they at this time probably yet were not believers in our Lord and Savior. They did not believe to him to be whom he said he was. And there's evidence in the uh, Gospel of John that they really thought he was, uh, well, he was weird. He was uh, out of, off his rocker. And they, uh, even his mother. And they came to seek to take him back there, there. Now everything's going to be all right. Sit down, uh, uh, come back home, and uh, uh, let us take care of you. You see, uh, he was misunderstood and, and perhaps you can understand that after all he grew up with them and they saw him living day by day and though his life was obviously different he didn't have a halo shining over the top of his head uh, certainly not but uh, they did not accept him as Jesus Christ uh, Mary his mother did not even accept him as John's mother had accepted him as the Messiah all right now point eight let's look at John's character this is both most interesting what is his temperament like, point A? His temperament varies to two extremes. On the one hand, he is very reserved, even reticent, extremely quiet, and retiring. On the other, he had a vicious temper even to the point of violence. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Only the control of God, the Holy Spirit, can take both of these and mold John into the personality God can use to glorify God the Son. It's very important for us to realize that we all carry with us excess baggage, which I have taught in great detail in the doctrine of how to be a super-Christian. 
Uh, as I speak this, I have now completed the editing of the, uh, the material. I have uh, copied it from my computer onto disks and have forwarded the disks to my, uh, my amanuensis, my cohort, my associate, my, my uh, secretary, uh, David Kern, and his uh, sweet wife, Stephanie, and uh, uh, they are in the process uh, uh, of uh, getting it into the form where it can be printed into booklet form, and it's going to be uh, uh, published, and it'll be available to you, but it'll be very important for you to pick up on this excess baggage. But we all carry excess baggage into the Christian way of life, and while God does not want to make one stereotype personality out of all of us, he does want to take the excess baggage, the weaknesses in our personality, and uh, he wants to get rid of those, and he can do that by the power of the filling of the Holy Spirit, or the control of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the omnipotence of God takes the diamond in the rough, gets rid of the, uh, the, the edges which are wrong, and produces a fantastic luster so that the personality, as diverse as it may be, can reflect the beauty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He does not want us all to be stereotyped personalities. That is not his uh, will. The part of John's personality that had to be gotten rid of was the temper. And I'm going to take you into that in just a moment, so just hang in there. Subpoint B under point 8, John plays only a secondary and very obscure part in the Gospels. And only three statements are attributed to him in his own account. Uh, John 1.38, we read, Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, and this would be, uh, maybe it was Andrew speaking, maybe not John, but at least uh, John and Andrew are, are, are uh, at least attributed to this. They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Uh, uh, later on in John 13, 25, leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And then in John 21, 7, we read that the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Uh... You know, uh, John kept himself in the background, observing, contemplating, drinking in, satisfied with his own temperament. He was content to let Peter occupy the forefront. There is no arrogance in the Apostle John. We do not see him pushing himself. Uh, I, uh, I don't want to appear arrogant in any way, but I have often seen in, uh, in John my uh, reflection of myself, or I see myself a reflection of John. I don't know which is the way. But I, many people do not understand and realize that I am a very, very shy, reticent person. Uh, as I have said frequently, when I was in high school, I had only one good friend and a few who were... Uh, uh, friends, but not really. Uh, the, I, I very rarely let anyone into my own inner circle, and very rarely became part of someone else's inner circle. Uh, I, uh, even to this day, uh, will uh, have to force myself uh, if I'm going into a group of people to uh, mingle, to mix. Uh, and I am just as content to sit in the background and to drink everything in, to listen, to perceive, to an analyze, and so forth, rather than to uh, become pushy. But uh, uh, that's the way I am. And at the same time, uh, uh, I have a, a, a temper which, uh, unless it is controlled by God the Holy Spirit, can be uh, described by the violence of the temper of, our, uh, of, uh, 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 of the Apostle John. Um, in Luke 9, 49 and 50, uh, notice, notice how he re reacts. Master, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. 
Jesus said, do not stop him. For whoever is not against you is for you. Hmm. Uh, you see, you know, that, that temper coming out, uh, he sees some people uh, uh, casting out demons in the name of the Lord. But he, the man was not a member of the, the disciples. And that evoked this strong reaction on the part of James and John. Uh, in Mark 3.17, our Lord gave James and John a nickname. James, uh, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, parenthesis, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Just as an electric charge is slowly accumulated in a cloud until it suddenly breaks forth in lightning and the thunderbolt, so our Lord Jesus Christ observed in these two loving, passionate, retiring men, James and John, the similar characteristic. They went deep. They were slow to erupt. But under certain circumstances, they will violently break forth. Such as we find again in Luke 9, verses 52 to 55. The Lord Jesus sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Note verse 54. When the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? <laughs> Can you see that? The thunder erupts. And the Lord Jesus in verse 55 turns and rebukes them. The Apostle John in his, in his uh, uh, the gospel account and in the uh, three epistles, fantastic emphasis on loving one another. Nevertheless, dormant but potential sharpness is in the life of this disciple, John. And he, when he's not controlled by the Holy Spirit, that can overcome the loving, gracious nature because it's there all the time, just under the surface, and there are certain things. You've heard the phrase, that just ticked me off. Well, there are certain things which set us off, certain things which are the, uh, the trigger mechanism that causes us to implode, and once we implode inside the soul, then we explode in the demonstrations as we have seen with the Apostle John. Furthermore, underneath the humble facade, and, and when he's controlled by the Holy Spirit, he is humble. But underneath the humble facade, there is a fantastic ambition on the part of James and John. And we see it in Mark 10, 35 to 37, where we read, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Doesn't that sound like a spoiled child? <laughs> Verse 36, What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, uh, Matthew agrees with Mark, but represents the request as actually coming from the lips of their mother, though the sons were no doubt responsible. But these were the places of highest honor and authority in our Lord's messianic kingdom. So Robertson, in his word study, says, The mother speaks for the sons, but they try to commit Jesus to their desires before they tell them what they are. Uh, he, and and what's, what's strange about this is the context of Mark. 10, because it's, he has just finished telling them he's going to the cross. He doesn't tell them he's setting up the kingdom. They, it goes right, right over their heads. It, it totally misses what they said because they are consumed with self 
advancement. So even in this very shy and humble and retiring man, there's inordinate ambition that is going to need something supernatural. And it's going to come when the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Felix Godet comments, we recognize in John one of those natures passionately devoted to the ideal which at first sight give themselves without reserve to the being who seems to them to realize that ideal. But the devotion of such persons easily takes on somewhat of elusiveness and intolerance. Everything that does not answer in sympathy completely to their enthusiasm irritates them and excites their indignation. They have no comprehension of a dividing of the heart, or what it is, any more than they know how to have such a divided heart themselves. What Godet is saying here is that there are some people who are so passionate in their devotion to something that if it doesn't go exactly their way, they cannot understand it. That seems to be the case of the Apostle John. I, I recall many times in my ministry where there have been people who have been positive toward doctrine and have been a part of the church. When the final decision has to be made and it's up to me to make it and it's made in a way that's different than other people in the congregation would have made, uh, we, they get to very uptight and, uh, and they peel off. I remember when we first started at Grace Memorial Bible Church, uh, we were meeting in the home of a family in Woodburn, and uh, then we, uh, we found a meeting place in a, uh, the, uh, a bank building in New Haven, and then the Methodist Church back in Woodburn became vacant, and they wanted us to uh, to go and uh, the family who, in whose home we were meeting wanted us to go back to Woodburn and to rent that building and eventually buy it and uh, make that the headquarters of Grace uh, Bible Church. And uh, because I had pastored in Woodburn and because I had resigned from that church and because uh, that Mennonite church and because there were several people in our new group who had been a part of that, I felt that it would it would be uh, a, a definite affront to uh, the people to go back to Woodburn, to the very same town in which I had ministered. And so I rejected that, and that family left us immediately. Uh, and uh, uh, they were very zealous, it seemed, for doctrine. But uh, they had an ideal, but I didn't measure up to that ideal. And there have been others through the years. When I have not done things the way they felt, they should be done, they peeled off and went after something else. And I'm not going to say whether they're right or wrong, but I'm going to tell you one thing. In all of these uh, nearly 50 years now, I have not deviated from teaching Bible doctrine on a consistent basis. Word by word, verse by verse, exegesis with categories of doctrine and uh, I'm still plugging away, believe it or not. The omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit can take any kind of a person and make out of that person God-likeness. Not transforming the personality. John never became a Peter. And John was satisfied not to be a Peter. He didn't want to be someone else. He didn't try to emulate someone else in his ministry. He didn't try to be another R.B. theme. He didn't try to be another Bill Pauley. He didn't try to be someone else. He recognized that he was who he was, and he had to be himself. And he had to be true to himself. And God took away the rough edges the part of the personality which was excess baggage and allowed the fullness of the, the loving, gracious Apostle John 
to reach through. All right, now let's move on quickly to point uh, nine, John's relation to the early church. We see him in very few instances, very few instances in the early church. Acts 3.1 One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Here then they encounter the crippled man who asks for money. Since they had none, they give him what they do have and the man is healed. This resulted in their arrest by the temple guards and in Acts 4.3 they seized Peter and John and because it was evening they put them in jail until the next day. And though the, uh, Peter is the spokesman, both men impressed the leadership according to Acts 4.13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. As a result, they were reprimanded and ordered not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus, Acts 4.19 and 20. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They were subsequently released, and in Acts 4.23 we read, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the, that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Secondly, Peter uh, I mean, J John goes to Samaria in order to finish the work begun by Philip. The evangelist. We read in Acts chapter 8 verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. In other words, they acted as the official welcoming committee to the new church as uh, among the original apostles. C. Tradition says that after the death of Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, which took place in about 48 A.D., John was now free to take a more active part in the affairs of the church, as I've already indicated. Thus, at the time of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, which takes place in about 50 to 51 A.D., James is regarded by Paul as uh, one of the pillars of the church, Galatians 2.9. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. Point 10, John in Asia Minor. After the Council of Jerusalem, John disappears from the scene until tradition depicts him as accomplishing a ministry among the churches of Asia Minor. Apparently, after the death of the Apostle Paul and his assistants, Timothy and Titus, John, because he was among the last survivors among the Apostles, emerges as the leaders of those churches to, quote, water what the Apostle Paul had planted. Subsequently, the Roman Emperor Domitian banishes John to the island of Patmos, which is off the coast of where Ephesus is located, from which location John writes the book of Revelation in about 96 A.D. It, it is therefore after the death of Paul and his banishment to Patmos that evidently the Johannine epistles were written. Point 11, the death of the Apostle John. If we assume that John was 20 to 25 years old when he was called in 30 A.D., in the year 100, John would have been between 90 and 95. It's said that he had himself carried by young men to the assemblies of believers in the churches. Traditions tell us that he was killed by the Jews and buried in Ephesus. And finally, point 12, I'm drawing from Felix Godet this conclusion. Peter was distinguished by his practical originating power, scarcely compatible with tender receptivity. P 
call united active energy and the most consummate practical ability the penetrating vigor of an unequaled dialectic. John is completely different from both. He could not have laid the foundation of the Christian work like Peter. He could not have contended like Paul with dialectic sub subtlety against Jewish rabbinism and composed the great epistles of the Galatians and the Romans. But in the closing period of the apostolic age, it was he who was charged with putting the completing work upon the development of the primitive church which Peter had founded and which Paul had emancipated. He bequeathed the world three works, institutions of the Christian life, that of the person of Christ in the gospel, that of the individual believer in the epistles, and that of the church in the future in the apocalypse. Now thank you, Heavenly Father for our study of this wonderful man and as we look at the epistle that he appends to the great lady May God the Holy Spirit teach us, not only from the things we have studied today, but which we shall study in the days ahead. I commit each one to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.